intro. Stand by for full video immersion. Hey guys, welcome back. We're uh, talking about The Who's Endless Wire, which uh, came out 10 years ago, so we're doing the 10th anniversary. And uh, right now we're going to pick up in the track listing and we're going to talk about the Wire and Glass mini opera on Endless Wire, which if you have the CD is tracks 10 through 19. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to go through the tracks and uh, Garrett has even provided us a little plot synopsis of the, uh, the mini opera. Yeah. So let's just get right into it. All right. So, um... What's the first track? first track is Sound Round, which uh, apparently is one that Pete has been sitting on since Lifehouse. Really? Yeah, this was recorded, this is like first demoed in like 1970, 71. You gotta imagine, he's got a lot of I left yeah. over from Lifehouse. Yeah, right? I mean, who's ne uh, Who Are You, rather, Right. was also a, a leftover from Lifehouse. I mean, so. that's, it's, it's, not to be funny, is that why no one can compile like a, a complete Lifehouse even to this day? Because mm, there's just so much? Part that, and partly <laughs> because the story is so weird. No yeah, some people good. have been successful. But, yeah. But anyway, what's uh, the history with uh, Sound Round? Okay, uh, well, I don't have a history of the song, rather, but um, in the story, uh, this begins with uh, many years ago. <laughs> Picture it. <laughs> many years ago. There was this rock musician named Ray High, who you will remember from, from Psychoderelict. Psychoderelict, which I recommend you pick up. This, the story doesn't really have much to do with uh, Wire and Glass, but it's a good album. Same character? Yes. All right. Yeah, this is sort of a sequel to Psychoderelict. Um, well, Pete's solo album, his last one. Uh, so Ray High is, many years ago when he was a younger man, he was rolling around the country in his camper van, uh, on just a road trip, when he gets a vision of a future society that is, uh, becomes strangled by wire and communications, is what it says. <laughs> uh, and this vision that he receives of this sort of dystopian future, uh, he eventually develops into the Grid Life Project, which he works mm, on in Psychotherapy. Sounds like something familiar. Yeah, it's pretty on-the-nose, semi-autobiographical stuff from Pete Townsend uh, and the Lifehouse Project. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's all that Psychoderelict was, was him reflecting on his own life. And this is just taking that at a different angle. Uh, what do you think of the song sound round? Uh, I only have, like, two lines of notes here. Um... It's hard to talk about a lot of the songs in the like, They're like a minute and a half. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I wrote here is, uh, I said, I don't know if the song is trying to be profound. It sounds like it's just like the opening of the opera. Yeah. Um, I did write here, it has a pretty cool uh, drum opening, mm. uh, whether it was played by, it's probably played by Pete. I'm going to double check on that real quickly. Um, it's track 10. Track so 10. It's uh, at the very beginning. Very beginning of the book. Talks about the All personnel. Right. Just hang on one second. Uh, it says here... Drums on 10. Peter Huntington uh, plays the drums. Yeah. Well, he does a really good job. I really dig the drum opening. It has, like, that Tommy era rock sound. Yeah, it. it does. And I know it's typical, well, they're both mini operas. Well, yeah, but they, they, they still sound similar. Mm -hmm. It's just in the way that this song sounds. Other than that, I think it's, I mean, it's fine. There really is not much I can go into it. Yeah. What about you? Um, I agree. It's It's got a good driving beat to it, and uh, it sounds sort of like a road trip song. Uh, yeah, there's just not really much enough of a song. We can't really say much more about it. Right. I think I actually repeated this one when it was over. I was like, oh, that's it. I didn't even write any notes on it. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, let's, let's move on. Okay. So, so the next track is Pick Up the Peace. Which is spelled P-E-A-C. Peace. Uh, so, Ray High, uh, many years, like, in the present day of the story, uh, sees the... He's he's in this sort of mental asylum, or sanatorium, it keeps saying in the notes, uh, because apparently he lost it after making Grid Life. I don't know. Screw it. And <laughs> there's so much of the story that you have to just kind of go, just, just okay, just sure. go with Just go with it. Just sure. bend your disbelief yeah, a lot of from that. the ceiling. So he's sitting in the sanatorium, and he gets more visions, because he does that. He's sort of the narrator of this story. Uh, and he sees this group of kids um, from the neighborhood he grew up in uh, forming a band uh, that they're calling the Glass Household, or 
glass for short. Uh, and so he observes them coming together uh, and, and just, you know, being teenagers together, really, for a long time. And uh, he contrasts this with his childhood, where he grew up in a city right after World War II, which had bombed buildings and uh, old soldiers walking around mm. as dads also and grandpas. Also sounds very autobiographical. Right, yeah. Again, more stuff that Pete had to deal with. And so his, Pete says the general theme of this song is asking how can uh, we as members of society, and probably more as, uh, from Pete's point of view, how can we relate to societal peace and how can we relate to peace in the universe and in our communities? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. As for the song itself, um, I did have to laugh. The opening line is, now I'm in the ether, and yeah. I'm, thank God it's not the same song. Yeah, um, because Ray High is the narrator of the song in the ether as well. Mm -hmm. and, and the ether is his sort of, I guess, maybe drug-induced Right. I'm just, I'm just glad it wasn't the same song again on the album. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, again, so short I can't pick it out. The only other line I have written here is I, I, I dig the transition to the next song. Yeah, definitely. The chorus... Those the are like song. my only two notes on the song, really. Right. I, I don't know. This song is kind of painful for me because it's like, how many things can you rhyme with peace and not make it sound forced? That's right. Like... Come on, let's try to pick up the piece, you and I, on our hands and knees, and like... Sure. <laughs> yeah, you just gotta just shrug your shoulders and go with it. Come on, let's try to touch the fleece, and like, the golden fleece? Like, the mythological... Oh, boy. It's, uh, the song's over in a minute and a half, anyway. Yeah, it's, it serves a purpose, and it gets out of the way, I guess. All right. So what comes next? Uh, next is Unholy Trinity, uh, which, this is the sort of, now we switch the camera, the point of view of the musical to uh, the opera to the three kids uh, in the neighborhood. The three. Could it be possible the kids are like a representation of Raj, Pete, and John when they were in their detour sort days? Sort of. Because they're the ones who came together, obviously, before Keith joined. Well, the three kids are... Uh, hang on. There it is. Uh, Gabriel, who's a, who is a Christian, Josh, who is a Jew, and Layla, who is a Muslim. Uh, they come together from very different backgrounds, and says this in the lyrics, um, to reform the Glass Household. And, uh... What's the Glass Household? That's their band. That's the name of the band. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, which is... I'll just refer to it as Glass to be, keep it simple from here on. Um, so, the way that the group dynamic apparently works out is that Gabriel composes the, mu the music because he hears music. They all have the special gift, and he hears music. Josh hears voices, uh, so he's the lyricist. And apparently Layla can fly. Suspend your disbelief, sure. Why the hell not? Yeah, I mean, I, I take that as a more metaphorical thing, so I'm just guessing. Oh, like she's, she's, she's flying, or what? No, no, I don't think that. I think it's just more along the lines of she has a charismatic stage presence, so she's the front person. Okay. Front woman. Man, uh, yeah, I never know what what is... Front, front the female man, front, front, woman. front man. I, I just jokingly call her front woman. Okay. Because it really we'll call it that. What it is. And I really like this one because it has such an innocent and joyous sound to it. I like it um, because I didn't know the story obviously going in, so I thought yeah. it was more of a reflection of, like I said, the, two, the three kids were like a representation of Raj, Pete, and John. Sure. And uh, in a way it is. Coming together and the detours of... Uh, and, I mean, I, I, I like the line I wrote, you know, three kids, uh, three ways to be, three different lives, uh, three different ways to smile, uh, not the same, we can talk, we hear the music. I really like that because, as we've discussed, you know, even if the Who didn't always get along, they could always play together. Yeah. There always was the music. So, I like when it says here, you know, we're not the same, but we can talk, and we remember the music, we can sing the music, we can play the music. So, that's how I kind of think back in the day, because they formed the Detroit when they were, like, what in their teens? Yeah. I mean, at that point, I mean, you know, they really, they didn't really know each other at first. So maybe you know, how could they talk to each other? But sure. but they bonded over music. John played the uh, the horn, and yeah. Pete and Pete and Roger played uh, guitars. Yes. Uh, so even if you know, like I said, they didn't they didn't communicate well at that young age. Uh, obviously, they did in later years, but they mm -hmm. they had the music. So for me, I got this, you know, looking back on it and just being like, yeah, I wonder if that's a Looking back on you know the early days, plus it is I kind of had to laugh at the whole unholy trinity yeah. because uh, 
you know, looking back, Pete's probably looking, yeah, we were a bunch of wankers. <laughs> yeah. We were, you know, we were so rough and tough and bad. Yeah. So we were so unholy. Uh, yeah. So I had to laugh at that that name. Yeah. And uh, it, and other than that, it, I think it's a fine track. Yeah. I, I kind of take just a bit of warning for anyone who's listening to this, you know, album and looks at the tracks and says, unholy, oh no. It's, there's nothing about it. It's just meaning they're not... The Holy Trinity. Right. <laughs> That's why I had to laugh. It was a, it was a very is, it was a very clever title. Yeah, there's three of them and they're not the they're three not the, aspects the, the three. of God. <laughs> the right. three persons of God. Alright. Okay, so, so what, what comes next? Next is Trilby's piano. Uh, I'm scared. I mean what can you at least try to explain? Okay, it? so the plot, the plot. Um so in this it's soap opera time, folks. Uh Josh's mother, who is a widow because uh, his father was killed in a suicide bombing, <laughs> fun stuff, um, her, his mother uh, tries to put all, basically brings in his uncle, Jaime, uh, who is her brother, to be the sort of breadwinner of the family, okay. right? And he eventually falls in love with Josh's father's sister, his Aunt Trilby. Okay. Yeah, she's the one who taught him music and how to love music. So that's where the name comes from. Yeah, Trilby's, Trilby's Piano is what inspired Josh to make music. Okay. And probably what made as the gateway to his, his gift of hearing music. Uh, and then in also in this song, um, Glass performs this sort of they write and perform this musical play as, you know, teenagers, uh, because Layla's father owns a studio. Hmm. And they sort of just do this sort of musical thing. They bring on this cute little puppet show and um, a small staircase as part of what they're doing. Keep going. I have something to say to that. Okay. Um, and, so, and so it just mainly talks about the relationship between Jaime and Trilby. Uh... Uh, this, before I get to the criticism of the track, I want to say this is an interesting thing because Pete is writing about an experience he had because he actually had an Aunt Trilby who uh, was that. very inspirational in making him want to pursue music through her piano playing. So he's being very autobiographical. explicitly autobiographical here. Oh, okay. And this is, he said it was interesting, write, and it was hard writing about this because this is one of the few times he's been inspired to write something out of a positive experience in his life. Like I mentioned earlier, he found it easier to write from growing experiences, negative things that happened to his him. His pains, his sufferings, yeah. and all that stuff. I had to, uh, I was smiling because you said it, they're putting on this like this puppet show. And yeah. One line I actually wrote here, it sounds very musical. Yeah. Like Disney almost. Yeah. It's very whimsical. It sounds, it sounds like something that someone could sing on stage as part of a, a big musical. That's what I got the impression. The also impression I got here is, I don't know if you'll totally agree with this, it uh, sounds a bit Brian Wilson-ish. Because... Uh, I, the, wouldn't, I don't have a frame of reference, really. The, the way that you get the piano in there, and the strings, and the sort of high singing, mm. which Brian Wilson does. Um, I mean, I know you really just know, like, pet sounds. Yeah. Uh, but it, it did sound a little like that. Obviously, Brian Wilson uh, sounds deeper, so the way that Pete Townsend sang... They both have sort of deep voices in their later years. It was very similar, but the way that Pete approached said high notes reminded me of how Brian Wilson approaches high notes, the way he sings now because his voice is lowered. Uh -huh. So that's just the only impression I got. Other than that, I really don't have anything else to say with the track. What about, what about you? I, I said that because I knew you were going to do that. Yeah. When I, when I listened to this, like the first few times I listened to this, I kept trying to get invested in it, but I kept realizing that this wasn't what I signed up for. Yeah. You know, why is this on a Who album? I kept asking It, it doesn't myself. sound like the Who? Yeah, because it's, we, we haven't really been describing it terribly much, but it's just piano and strings. And it, it just sounds like really cheesy and weird to me. Coming off a Who album, where I'm expecting power chords and mm -hmm. you know. I mean, they would have done their share of piano uh, string, yeah. stringy songs, yeah. but even those had some balls to them. Right, this one just seems so fluffy. Um, it it doesn't 
I can't say throwaway because it plays a vital role in the narrative of the opera. Uh, say least favorite? Yeah, this is probably the weakest track on the entire album for me. All right. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Do you want to move on then? Yeah. Let's move on. Okay. <laughs> so next would come the title track, yeah. Endless Wire. Endless Wire. So while rehearsing in the, in, uh, the studio, uh, Layla's father's studio, Glass find documents that Ray High has left behind because he used to record there because he and Layla's father used to be business partners. Like, he was uh, Ray's producer. And he find, they find all these documents there talking about grid life, about the... The, uh, the project. That the project made. that he finishes at the end of Psycho Derelict um, and apparently releases or something, but it, uh, it must not have made a splash or whatever. Uh, and they find all these documents talking about how... Uh, Ray wants to spread music all over the world to unify everybody using a wired network, sort of like use the internet to make everyone come together in a shared concert experience. Which is a cool idea in theory, but, you know, really hard to pull off. Uh, and they, they look at these all these notes and they say, we should try this. Yeah. We should try to do this. Uh, I should mention that uh, Glass also has five members, even though the three are the ones we focus on, uh, just so probably someone can play keyboards and drums or whatever. Okay. <laughs> um, I really like Endless Wire as a track. I think it's the first real song in the opera. Yeah, it's the first one they really dwell on for any sort of yeah. good period of time, I guess. A bit, I, I have it written here, I don't know if you'll totally agree with this, a bit country twangy singing. Yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. Uh, Pete does most of the singing on this one, I thought. He does most of the singing on the whole mini-opera, actually. Really? I was surprised You're to right. find that out. I was like, no Roger, no Roger, no Roger. I was yeah. like, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, it, could, it could have been too repetitive for me. Uh, the song, this version is like, what, a uh, minute uh, 551. Yeah. It could have been a little too repetition because at, at the end they just keep singing that phrase on the end yeah. of this wire. But it fades out at just the right time. So for me, it was like just short enough. Right. Uh, anymore, and I would have overstayed its welcome, and I would have just been like, okay, let's get on with it. So then how do you feel about the extended version that comes on most versions of the album? The extended version I actually uh, like because, like I said, because it feels like a real song. Uh -huh. It feels like a fully fleshed out uh, song. In terms of you know, what I just said, the, the repetition, um, I don't mind it, uh, but, on, but on this version, because I know that it is so short, I don't want to hear it too many times, but right as I start to get annoyed, it starts to fade. Um, and I really, I really like the extended version because, like I said, it, it feels like an actual song. Had they fleshed out any of the songs before this, I would have been like, I don't know if that would have worked. Yeah. Um, I'd say that uh, the extended version of Endless Wire is also one of probably the standout tracks on the album for me. Uh, partly because um, on Endless Wire, it uh, adds a lot of really cool vocal interplay between Roger and Pete, where most of the uh, the standard, uh, the non-extended version, is just Pete singing. Mm -hmm. uh, where Roger comes in on a really cool bridge right. that kind of kind of soars a little bit. Excuse me, and uh, they have this since it's the last track on the album, the extended version. Uh, I really like just hearing where are the two members of the Who now, and we're gonna just gonna trade. We're just gonna trade improvised vocals over the repetitious chorus. Right. And I was like, yeah, yeah, really, guys, it's really good. Way to send us off. Like you gotta that. imagine that's how they recorded it, and obviously it was just shortened to place in the the, mm -hmm. the, the mini opera. Right. Um, so that's really all I have to say about in this wire. I think it's a it, it's a it's a really good actual song. Yeah. Not just a minute fifty one of exposition or whatever yes yeah like some tracks are tending to do or tend to do on pete's rock operas like tommy there are some tracks that are just to move the narrative along yeah but luckily those are short <laughs> exactly so what comes next uh next is fragments of fragments take care i'm out uh <laughs> do not i don't like this one uh it's sort of a demo of fragments you know it's it, it seems like it's just more experimentation by lawrence ball and the uh the method uh, programming based on the fragments loop. Uh, yeah, it's... 
It's not that. Di it's not that different. No, not really. It's, but it's it's shorter. It's not sung by Roger, which right, is it's, interesting it's to know. by Pete. Yeah. The effects on the vocals. Uh, yeah, it just it sounds very. It sounds so synthetic. Weird, and, weird, weird, weird. and what's what's worse is that when they put that effect on the vocals during the what's it. Uh, the, the 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 middle part. Mm. Uh, are, we we, are, 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 are we the parts oh, section? Right, yeah, yeah. The, not only is the effect on the vocal, the vocal is buried at that point, and the synths are louder, and it's so annoying. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> oh my gosh! And especially since I didn't, I didn't, wasn't a big fan of the first fragment. Uh, I had some positives to think about that first one, but just coming in again, it's like, <sighs> get on with it, please. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry if you really, really like this track. I, I don't though. I don't think Good. it's superior. Good. We're on the same page. I don't think it's superior to the original fragments. It's just sort of. Uh... But that's the thing. To have a worse version of a song, you kind of go eh on. It's yeah. I don't. I don't see why exactly it's there, other than the fact that they're saying that uh, the song fragments, like the first track on the album, that isn't Bob uh, O'Reilly, isn't part of the. <laughs> It isn't part of the mini mini opera uh, track listing. The actual song fragments is uh, Glass's first big hit. Mm -hmm. It's their first single that goes, you know, that goes way big. And now I guess this is a remix they're doing or something. I don't know. Yeah, uh, can't quite tell. It's just there to remind you that fragments is the hit. Yeah, and that's fine. Speaking of the hit, next track is we got a hit. We got a hit. Yeah. The what I call the second real full song in this opera. Right, right. So what's what's going on here? Uh, so now this is this song um, is a sort of a transitional one uh, where it takes a lot of time and condenses it here into a minute eighteen, uh, where it, it goes between you know fragments as a hit and then they just become these huge sort of celebrity they become yeah. icons and. Uh, they become master manipulators of the media and of uh, uh, video and everything, and uh, and then of course the things that come with the fame uh, will eventually drag them down, and you don't really get a sense of that. Not in this track. Not, not in this no. track. No, and that's where uh, right after this was supposed to be where the track "It's Not Enough" comes in. Oh, I didn't know it was part of the. It's supposed to be part of the mini opera. Yeah, Pete includes it in Wire and Glass as so Gabriel and Layla, two members of Glass, um, eventually get married. There's this sort of love triangle between Gabriel, Layla, and Josh. Uh, Gabriel and Layla get married, but he finds it really hard to please her hmm. about various things, and eventually they and then Josh and Layla have an affair because Gabriel's uh, going out and being a rock star having affairs with uh, other people, and it actually gets a chick pregnant. Um, <laughs> but that that's all about It's Not Enough, but uh, when we got a hit, man, this is this is another one of my favorites on this album, we especially should the extended we version. We should mention this is the other extended version that's on the album. Mm -hmm. I see the potential of a full song in this uh, short um, minute 18, and I'm glad it was fleshed out, because had they not, I would have been like, oh, that would that would have worked. Yeah. Uh, but I'm glad they fleshed it out. I have to imagine the lyrics are also autobiographical, yes. how they felt when they heard I Can't Explain uh, being played, like I said, reach number eight in the UK. That was for their first real single. Let's not count that uh, high number zoot, zoot. crap. <laughs> um, for the, so their first single to go that high was just, you know, must have been put them over, you know, overjoyed. Yeah, absolutely. So I can imagine these lyrics were like reflecting on that, that yeah. time in their life. Right. Uh... And you just get this great sense of motion and a lot of things happening at once and yeah. uh, a lot of temptation coming into it, too. Right. Uh, so then... The only last thing I have to say about We Got a Hit is I yeah. do... I, I, just about the song, I really do like the vocals and the interplay between the Roger and, and Pete doing the... We the got a hit, chorus. good news. We it's, got it's, a it's hit. It's really good interplay, and I'm glad they fleshed, yeah. I'm glad they fleshed it out because that's, that is such good interplay that I'm glad there's a full track we can listen to that absolutely and yeah the, the full track uh which also includes part of the next song which we're going to talk about they made my dream come true uh as a bridge on the extended version and that's really cool too how they'll mm. incorporate something else uh and just you know again we see great interplay between roger and pete and the different elements they add to songs mm -hmm. uh next track then is they made my dream come true where 
bad shit is going down mm-hmm. is the general vibe you get from this because you go from a lot of motion, a lot of cool and good things happening, and then immediately it kind of slams down with they made my dream come true. Right. Uh, where we go back to Ray High, who's sitting in his hospital room, uh, in another ether vision where he sees someone dying at a glass concert. By this time, glass is broken up uh, and have gone their separate ways. Uh, and they're going to have a reunion concert, though. Uh, and he sees this vision of someone dying at the glass concert, but he can't quite tell who. It might be someone in the audience, maybe multiple people in the audience. He thinks it might even be a member of Glass. Uh, and he can't, but he can't even tell if this is a vision, a premonition, or if this is just a dream that he's having. Hmm. A very hazy sort of dream. And it's, it's pretty easy to see that this is also an autobiographical song, if you know your stuff about Who history, because... Uh, in 1979, there was a Who concert in Cincinnati where 11 kids were trampled to death. And I was, was just going to say, I wonder if he was, re- if Pete was reflecting on that. Yeah, where 11 kids were trampled to death uh, because the stupid people at the at the venue didn't know how to crowd control. Uh, they to to make a long story short, there was the stage in the middle of the stadium, and they only had like one big door and one hallway to let people in. And they and the state the venue had multiple entrances, but they just for whatever reason decided to use just one hallway. Well, that's going to cause the kids some problems. Who, and the kids who fell uh, were stampeded. Yikes! And so uh, and they didn't, the band didn't even know until after the the show. After the first set. I oh, think. first I didn't I thought it was after the show. Yeah. Um, so oh wow. No, I, no, they knew before the show. They did. Oh they no, did. no 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 no. The manager knew before. The manager the show. knew, but but he Bill Kirbishley, yeah. But he told he he swore not to tell them until after the show yeah. was done. Yeah, and he and the you know, the organizers, the venue owners and stuff came to Bill Kirbishley, the manager, and said, People have just died here. What we can't we have to cancel the show. And he like, said, No. People came if we cancel the show, there will be a fucking riot. And probably more people <laughs> would have been killed. Or, yeah. or who knows? And so the who went on kind of it could be seen as tasteless, but they didn't know. They didn't and, know. So uh, you can't blame and them. And they were, and, and acting on Bill Kirbishley, they were trying to protect the people who were there and still okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they made my dream come true is obviously a reference to that, and also uh, Pete says to the Altamont the, concert, the Rolling, Rolling Stones. Stones, where a similar thing happened. Yeah, he wasn't stumbled; he was stabbed. Oh God! By a member of the Hell's Angels, which the, the Stones right. hired as their like quote bodyguard, security, whatever. Mm-hmm. And someone was stabbed. And the unfortunate thing is that was filmed, and it is a concert film called "Give Me Shelter." Um, I have not seen it, nor do I know if I ever will. Yeah. But it's a very scary time, and um, kind of later, Crosby, Stills, and Nash played that same festival a few uh, a little bit later, and they just said, even though no one really got hurt there, it was just bad vibes. Sure. Sure. What do you think of the song, then? It's the shortest song. I literally have nothing to say. Uh, ex- the only thing, really, is just the the transition from We Got a Hit to the Make My Dream Come True is I, is listening back, knowing that the extended version exists, I could mm-hmm. hear that something was missing. Like, We Got a Hit should have been longer, and it was cut uh, to make room for this song. This one... I, I, you know, I like the lyrics, you know, the idea of feel, uh, feeling of being famous, the... Uh, you know what the consequences are. People yeah. could uh, be killed. You could have a destruction in the band, whatever. Other than that, the song is barely a minute. I have no thoughts on it. <laughs> I like it enough. I, it's fine. It's hard, it's hard to it's hard to gauge whether you like a song when there's not much to it. But uh, the things I do like about it mainly are about the sort of general sound to it, where it feels like a kind of Scottish folk song, sort of along the lines of. Uh, Working class hero, or um, yeah, yeah. What was the David Gilmore one? Faces of Stone. Yeah, yeah, sort of that. Which is David's working class hero? Yeah, yeah. That sort of heavy, uh, sort of uh, hammer on guitar kind of riff to it. Um, here done in a little more fleshed out way with drums and such. Um, Pete's vocals on it are solid. Not, you can't really complain about that. Not amazing, but... Uh, but that's my problem. Nothing to rave about. Right. It's another s- it's a song next... that serves the story. Right. So, moving on. Mirador. All right. Hell yes, The long, longest song in the mini-opera. Yeah. 
and for good reason, this is like the showcase song. This is the song, uh, this is sort of the one could fool again, I would say, of, of this opera. Um, so, in the, uh, in the story, Glass is performing their reunion concert, which they've decided will be an elaborate version of their musical play that they uh, played as teenagers, except now, instead of a cute little puppet show, they're going to have an enormous multimedia event uh, with mm. a giant staircase in the background held up by, like, blimps or something. I'd pay to see that. Yeah, man. In Central Park, too. Which is cool and all, but New York is kind of a shady town sometimes. Oh, yes. And they see that. They're like... Uh, it mentions in the story I read that Gabriel looks out of his... A hotel window and sees like people getting mugged in the streets uh, and so they of course uh, and Gabriel is both Josh and Gabriel are kind of at this point a little bit strung out on uh, substances and they and Josh especially is getting paranoid so they hire security guards to uh, be near them while they're performing okay um, and the concert's going great uh, they come they play fragments. It's a huge hit. Crowd of the audience. And, yeah. Okay. And um, eventually, as they're playing, they sort of realize that what they're doing. They're also, uh, I should mention, uh, this concert is also a world event. Uh, it's a webcast. It's, it's being broadcast to the entire world. Right. Okay. So a lot of people are tuning in, uh, streaming it over the internet now, and uh, because so many people are tuned into this one event and are tuned into this music. Um, at the top of the staircase on the in the show, uh, what was originally supposed to be just like a pyrotechnic effect becomes an actual like portal to uh, heaven. Yeah, to showbiz heaven, which is kind of like a bar or a pub after a show where a, lot, a bunch of rock stars and uh, that that are name dropped in the song uh, just kind of hang out and talk to each other. Well, it's interesting to note all the the stars that are mentioned by two thousand six have all passed. Except for Doris Day. Except for yeah, she had because passed. Pete didn't know that she was not that she was still alive. <laughs> he Whoops. kind of assumed that she had passed away by this time, and he was like, "Uh." I assumed she she had too. Yeah, I'm with you, Pete. Yeah, and um, so they get a glimpse of all these rock stars sort of gathering at the top of the staircase, uh, inviting them to come through what's called the mirror door. That's the portal, um, and so. Because, as I mentioned, Josh is uh, kind of is kind of strung out and paranoid. He's it said he's a schizophrenic, a paranoid schizophrenic in uh, in the story notes I saw. Uh, he kind of uh, also he's also really jealous of uh, of Gabriel for being married to his love Layla, and he grabs gun from security guard and shoots Gabriel. Hmm. And of course, Gabriel's body falls, but his soul is like still standing. So he decides to just I'm going to walk up the stairs and go through the mirror door now. Also, it says in the notes that it's never clear what if this actually takes place. What? <laughs> yeah, the <sighs> suspended disbelief even more. Yeah, like is like this, like is this a dream, a it, vision, or ev either everyone in the webcast and the live audience are sharing a collective hallucination. Or it's just Josh, or maybe this actually happened, or it. And I, I don't. Pete even, is all about multiple interpretations. I don't even. I don't even know. Yeah. I, I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> yeah. I but do, but the song though. The yeah, song, the song's. The, the song, song is, is killer. I freaking love it. <laughs> I don't. I oddly I don't find it that memorable, which is odd considering that really? it's, it's the longest in the the opera. But I listening right now. I'm trying to remember how it it goes. I remember some lyrics in it. I remember the names that were dropped in it. Mm. But I, I I'm trying to get a feel for the melody, and it's not coming to me. So I I was it's very odd that when this one ended, I was like, why don't I remember that one? That was playing the longest. I should have it should have stuck with me. Um, but I did write uh, while, I, while I was listening to it. Um, <laughs> would it be wrong to say that uh, because it was so this is toward the end and it's big? Would it be wrong to kind of compare it to where? Uh, we're not going to take it from Tommy, because in that song, which yeah, is which, yeah, I mean, you can look at the facts. It's the longest on. It's the longest on that album if you don't count Underture. Mm. Uh, longest song. Uh, it's the end, um, and I found a lot of the lyrics similar to "See Me Feel Me" in a way. 
uh, where, I forget what it is exactly, I'm going to look at the lyrics, but they say something along the lines of, uh, where is it? Um, if you don't hear me, how can I tell you? If you don't listen, why should I speak? Oh, yeah. See me, feel me, touch me, heal me. Just sort of. I mean, I'm not. I don't think. I don't. I don't think that was intentional. No. But that's just the feeling that I got. And musically, I found this song kind of similar to Sparks in a way. Yeah. The dun 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 dun. dun, dun yeah, a little the way, bit. The way that that uh, comes in. The other note I have on this song is uh, the name dropping musicians. I didn't know the story. So sure, I sure. thought I thought they were they were they were just placed in here. Um, I knew the Mirador had something to do with heaven, especially with mentioning all the passing rock stars: Buddy Holly, Elvis, Ray Charles, yeah, um, Ludwig Van, which he said, to, which, which not I know, but he, he said he said Ludwig Van to rhyme with band. That was kind of like a little cheesy, but <laughs> sure. Um, but I didn't know that's why they were name dropping it. And you know me, uh, the, the, the whose most recent song, "Be Lucky." They also name drop a few artists: ACDC, Daft Punk. Yeah. And I wasn't a big fan of them doing it there. So here it was kind of like, uh, "Come on, guys, you can do better than this." But mm -hmm. now that I know the story, now I kind of feel like I should retract that statement. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but it, it reminded me of "Be Lucky," and and that in that song, I was not a fan of them name dropping the mm -hmm. those artists. Mm -hmm. Um, but so where, what, what do you think of the song? Uh, it says kick ass. What do you like so much about yeah, it? Uh, first off, I fell in love with it just like from the opening riff, man. That's so, it's so great. <laughs> uh, it was like, yeah, this is the who I know that exactly. has great power chords and, uh, really cool lyrics that, uh, require some thinking to really get a grasp on, especially, um, I really like what it says about, uh, going to a concert and experiencing music uh, live and how it's such a special thing that sometimes you can just get totally caught up in it and transport it to another world. Oh, yes. Uh, not as literally in the in the case of the no. story, but, uh, but still, there is something intangible that happens whenever you listen to a really good band live. That's a good point. I, I, I didn't think about it that way. Yeah, I mean, you know, I was doing, when we went to go see The Who uh, about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, in uh, Dallas. Uh, I, I did things there that I never thought I'd be able to do. Like I was standing up pretty much the entire concert and singing along and dancing to the whole thing, and it was gone in a blink. Uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it was just a great time. It, I had a similar feeling when we saw the Pink Floyd tribute band. Yes, um, that too. Because I listen to so many to so much music that they're just another band. Mm -hmm. But to hear two hours of nothing but Pink Floyd music was like was like you know what, it's still good even if I don't listen to it because I listen to eight thousand other artists. Yeah, it was just like you know tonight I don't need anything else. Yeah, and even for me, someone who listens to I, I call them the high five, uh, my top five bands that I listen to. Like almost just them, pretty much. Uh, Beatles, Who, Pink Floyd, Genesis, Rush. Yeah, <laughs> he knows me. <laughs> uh, even though I listen to like just the High Five, I, I can still have a, a cool experience like you had at the Pink Floyd concert, where I've listened to Dark Side of the Moon so many times, mm -hmm. and some of the songs, as I've said before, have gotten have gotten kind of stale for me. Great Gig in the Sky, On the Run, uh, Us and Them. But going to see them live, where they're produced for you right there for your enjoyment and the people around you, it's such a special, kind of a small thing, and also to see it done in a slightly different way, like the tribute band was playing, was playing the songs. Uh, yeah, like on the run and like any color you like, they kind of just like yeah. did very abridged versions. Yeah, which it was, I understand. It's hard to do live because that since they're not Pink Floyd. <laughs> yeah, uh, and. Uh, and then it, that was the first time I'd ever like truly enjoyed Great Gig in the Sky, and seen an entirely different, uh, seen it in an entirely different way. Um, but yeah, live. Uh, basically, what Marador is saying to me is that live music, especially, has some kind of magic that you can't get from listening to listening. a CD. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. And I didn't think about that, and now I'm feeling bad saying the song was so forgetful, because <laughs> now I'm going to go back and, you know, think think about that. Mm. Any other notes uh, about that one? That's my favorite track from Wire and Glass. All right. <laughs> so let's move on to the closer of Wire and Glass, which okay. is Tea and Theater. Right. So what happens in the story? Okay, so years after the incident in Central Park, 
Uh, so Gabriel's dead. Yes. Because Josh shot a man he got in front of thousands of people, <laughs> millions of people, if they're counting the webcast. Um, he probably got arrested. He yes. He uh, he now lives at the sanatorium next to Ray High's room. <laughs> <laughs> And so, uh, since what are you in for? <laughs> since they're in such close proximity, they say, "Hey, you know that grid life thing," <laughs> and they they do the same play with the patients in the mental hospital. Uh, Ray Hyatt, Folsom Prison. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. And um, and they invite Layla to come by and see it. And uh, before or after, doesn't really say. Josh and Layla have some tea together because they're British, you know, like you do. They take tea, they take tea together and uh, just sort of talk about you know their lives, their careers, reflect on what's happening now that they're older, much older. They're probably in their fifties at this point, um, or maybe eh, maybe not. I don't know how much yes. older Ray High is than them because he's still alive. Uh, and then meanwhile, Ray is uh, looking at the play that he and the inmates, or no, patients, it's a mental place, he and the patients have put on uh, and confuses it, maybe he's senile, maybe he's getting other visions, confuses it for the Central Park performance, or maybe it's actually the same thing and it's timeless. I don't know. Uh, just go with it. Yeah, it's, it just it becomes a timeless performance to Ray, I guess. And that's where it ends. Yeah. I like Teen Theater as a song. I, I do, I, too. I always have. Yeah. Um, what I like about it, well, there's a lot of things I like about it. Um, it's the old, fa it, it's the dynamic uh, duo. Mm. Uh, Pete on guitar, <laughs> again, was experimenting with some different tunings, I noticed. And, and also with, uh, he programmed the drum track drum, in this. Very drum simple. Track. Very simple, but uh, totally. But funny. there really isn't much you could have done with the uh, percussion wise. Yeah, and then live, they just play a two acoustic guitar and Roger sings, and that's it. Right. No, I, I, that is exactly the vision I get with this song. It is kind of an epilogue uh, of people just drinking tea, which is very British. God, uh, yes. And just reflecting, talking about life, you know, what they, what they did. Uh, and Pete Ro and Roger close uh, a lot of concerts with this song. They didn't yeah. close it when we saw them, obviously, because uh, it wasn't, wasn't no, a hit. They closed it when I saw them in 2013. Right. Yeah, it's on the, the live Quadrophenia album yeah. as well. Uh, so you can tell this song like, has a lot of meaning to them. Mm -hmm. um, and I also just get the, the, the vision, you know, the, the, the two friends sitting alone on stage. The, the crowd is gone. The stadium is littered with beer and nachos and you just have the, the, the custodians just you know br uh, pushing at all the garbage and the, the garbage disposal or whatever and just roger and peter on stage and pete's like more tea raj oh yes thank you pete just, re just reflecting <laughs> like on having a private tea party like having a tea party it's like it's i like, feel like, like be like did something happen here i feel like it's probably something more like they that's, just that's the they just like scrape a couple of chairs together they put the the pot of tea yes. on, on the amps. On the amps, and yes. They, and then they just pour mugs for each other and kind of lean back and they're like, we did good, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's not just, you know, we did a good show, but, you know, you got to imagine I'm, I'm like, like when like they do it overall. now. Exactly, but now they look back, you know, we, we did good. We had some hit records. We made some good music. Yeah. And let's just have some tea and just, you know, kinda, sit quiet for yeah. a while. Kind of kind of the way that uh, Pete looks at the kids are all right as a song now. So, man, we got lucky, but in the end... Turns out really well, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. that's the, always the vision I got with this song, and mm -hmm. I, I, it's, it's really beautiful. And I love the line I had, had to write down, um, one of us dead, one mad, one me, all sad. And, I, of course, I didn't know the story. Obviously, the one of us dead is about Gabriel. Yeah. Um, who is supposed to be singing this one, Ray or Josh? Because uh, it says one of us I mad. Think it's, I think it's Josh. Okay, then one of us mad would probably be Layla, Layla, and yeah. one me. But I always just um, or, maybe, or maybe it's it's the more Britishism of mad, and that Josh is the insane one. Oh, okay. And maybe Layla's the narrator of this. Well, the the, the, the it could work either way. It, it could work either way. I mean, I didn't know the story, so I looked at it as it was actually a reflection of of uh, the band. One of us is dead. Yeah. Obviously, it'd be two, not one. One of us is mad. It's probably Roger's way of saying, you know, Pete's a mad son of a gun. Mm -hmm. uh, and one me, meaning, you know, we're, and we're all different people. But going back to uh, one of the songs earlier, you know, we're all different people, but we still make a good sound together. Yeah. And let's just have a cup of tea. Yeah. So that's... It, it, it seems very indicative of their friendship as well. Because I did 
I watched a recent interview uh, with Roger, and it was mainly about uh, the Teenage Cancer Trust that he runs. Um, and they also he talked about uh, his experience with The Who and his relationship with Pete. Uh, and they said, they're not best friends. They're mm. just very good friends who come together once in a while to make some music. And mm. I thought, wow. Wow. And that they just sort of have this immense respect for each other and this sort of understated love between them. Mm -hmm. And that's really cool, I think. All right. So that rounds out uh, the album itself. Um, and yeah, it does have the extended versions of We Got Hit and Endless Wire mm -hmm. after Tea and Theater. And we did mention that the deluxe editions come with a bonus uh, DVD of Live in Lyon. Is that how you yes. it? And then the bonus CD is basically that with a couple of extra songs yeah. thrown in. I it's it's I unfortunate. It. I think it's unfortunate they chose uh, the Lyon concert because it. Mm, I just felt like neither of the the original members of the Who were just on that night because uh, looking at the concert, which is about half an hour long of five tracks. Uh, we should probably say what's on the DVD. Yeah, comes with, I can't explain. Behind Blue Eyes, Mike Post theme, the only track from this album. Baba right. O'Reilly. And won't get fooled again, but won't get fooled again. That includes a little bit of uh, old red wine in it, doesn't it? Does it? Well, maybe I'm thinking of something else. I don't. Uh, I don't well, anyway, want. those are the five that are on the DVD and the CD. Ads, I think, Relay, Greyhound Girl, Who the Are Seeker. You, and The Seeker, yeah. which is kind of interesting because you get live performances of Relay and Greyhound Girl, yeah. two tracks that are kind of rare. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I, like I said, I wouldn't recommend. Like, if you can just find, like, the standard version of Endless Wire, then great. If you yeah. can, if you really, really want to get the bonus stuff for it, go have fun. I just, I, like I said, it's just, Roger's voice is not on point. Uh, Pete just seems kind of going through the motions a little. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it's it's good enough. <laughs> well, now that we've, we've covered the album, and we did mention er earlier that the album, you know, hasn't really been... It, looked at too kindly it uh people have probably given it a lot of crap it's an easy target yeah. um but you know going through the songs you know we, we found some things to dig into we found some things that were kind of eh, and some things that were you know exactly what we said yay and exactly on yeah, the entire yeah. album um but overall listening to it i i still stand by i said this sounds like a good document of where they were in 2006 you know looking back on you know, things they had done people they had seen uh, come and go, um, musical uh, experiments that Pete uh, had experimented with and put on this album. And collaborations with Rachel. Collaborations. Yeah. Um, so overall, Endless Wire, I still came out of saying it's a very fine album. Yeah. Uh, I don't consider it a great album, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't consider it an, an abomination. I mean, great, the, who have, like, what, nine studio albums? It's kind of hard to have, like... Maybe, you know, like, twelve. Well, the, the point is, they're not like the Rolling Stones where they have, like, 35, and you can absolutely pick a dud. Not yeah. that I've heard all 35, and I don't know if I want to. <laughs> um, but overall, let's do what we always do, and let's rate how we feel the album, Yeah. Uh, how it fits on our, our scale. What, what, are you, where, what are you giving this? I'm giving this a very biased 4 out of 5, uh, because... That is biased. <laughs> because uh, the good stuff is really good, and I even... When I'm in the right mood, I find the stuff that I'm not a huge fan of, whether that's in the ether or even Trilby's piano, toler at least tolerable, or find things that I really enjoy about each of them. Uh, and yeah, again, it it's it just holds a great place in my heart because it was the first Who album I got. That was great. For me, coming in not so biased and yes. having heard it literally like no more than five times, uh... I came out more positive than I thought it was going to uh, to be. Um, so overall, I'm going to go with a solid three and a half out of five fragments. Uh, <laughs> I would have gone either three or 3.25, because I'm thinking in terms of ten, like six, six and a half. But yeah. the highest I can go is 3.5. So I'm going to I'm gonna stick with that sure. for my rating for Endless Wire. Yeah, I'll always say that uh, any legendary rock band like The Who should be proud if this happens to be the last album they make. Which I they hope should, it's not. Uh, I, I do hope. I do hope it's not because there's a lot to improve on this and also 
you know, it's been 10 years, guys. Come on. Yeah. Uh, we, we can't keep reading articles that you're writing songs. Yeah. Publish the damn thing. Yeah, where's Floss, dude? What's Floss? That was the album they were planning on making in 2010. Okay. It didn't happen, well, apparently. Not, not only that, you know, give us uh, the outtakes that Pete even talked about this album. He talked about yeah. like, in the attic, he either played a few or he just mentioned them. Like, yeah. where, where are they? <laughs> Can we just get another scoop yeah. from Pete, maybe? Yeah. Or, That'd be nice. Or could you hire us to go through their vaults God, or something? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, as I was saying, if this happens to be their last album... This is a great note to go out on. I think it's I think it's it's pretty any, solid. Any legendary band of their stature would be proud to go out on this note. I think it's a pretty solid note. I mean, I hate to say, but it could have been worse. It could have, could have. I mean, it took twenty four years. Yeah, and... there are so many there's so many bands and things like uh, Genesis kind of comes to mind that where you feel like the last thing they did together was like, guys, just just. Oh, you should have stopped earlier. Yeah, you gotta do I better meant, than I that. I meant the 2007 live album, which uh, a lot of people say they sound older and slower. Well, and, they are. <laughs> well, they, it's just that they they sound less edgy than they used to I be. Know, I know, I know. Edgy is a descriptor. Anyway. All right. So <laughs> that is our review of The Who's Endless Wire. Now, tell us, listeners, oh, sorry, viewers, tell us uh, what you think of the album. Do you like it? Have you bought it? Which version have you bought you know, what are your some of your favorite tracks? Uh, do you think the album holds up after 10 years? I think it holds up pretty well uh, for us Who fans. For some people, it's kind of like, eh, it, it was a thing. If you're a casual Who fan, this is not your album. Yeah. So let us know all that down below. Uh, be sure to subscribe and uh, click that like button. Uh, check us out on our YouTube channels. I'll put a link uh, in the description below for uh, that. Mm -hmm. So you guys, oh, sorry, go ahead. You should also check out my blog at garrethicks.ocreate.com plug. And uh, uh, if you can't remember that, we'll put a link in yes, the description we as well. Uh, also, I just I forgot to mention earlier, uh, while we're on the subject of The Who, I read, and I don't know if you heard about this, that uh, The Who are, also, are still touring, apparently, even though they said the last year's tour was, that was it, that was it. Uh, Money. <laughs> sure. It's a guess. Um, they, they're touring England, anyway. Yeah. In some parts of Europe. Doing an acoustic version of Tommy. Yeah, I I had gotten the uh, the little email about that. Yeah, and I am like way too excited about that, and I really hope that they make recordings of it. Yeah, hopefully it gets a release. Yeah. All right. Because well, good God, Pete Townsend just playing an acoustic guitar. Would all there night. be any guests, or is it really just? Uh, it didn't say in the, it didn't say in not, the announcement. Not yet. So we don't know if we're, if we're going to get an I actual think, Uncle Ernie or... No, I think it's just going to be Roger and Pete and their normal backing group. All right. Just unplugged. All right. Well, if that comes out, maybe we will do a review for that. Oh, hell yes. As if it comes out. Yeah. I, we, we, yeah. we hope. We'll see. We'll see. Yep. We'll see. So thank you guys so much for uh, watching. Say bye-bye. 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 All right. And we'll see you guys next time. And once again, please, one, two, three, and hit it! Hey everyone, thanks for listening to part two of our discussion about The Who's Endless Wire album celebrating its 10 year anniversary. We'd love to hear from you what you think of the album and our review of it. Let us know all of that in the comments, check out the other episodes of Triple Threat, and subscribe for more. Don't forget to like this episode and we will see you all next time. Bye-bye. I don't know what this is. I, I think I just called him a loser. Uh, That's one for the outtakes. Hey-o!